Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, we have yet another real treat today. Uh, most of you probably know or could guess that Stanford has quite a well-developed and productive energy innovation ecosystem. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today who a lot of people have contributed to the ecosystem here, probably a couple of hundred. But if I had to think of two people who are kind of most uh, vital in achieving what's been achieved so far and thinking about uh, the way forward with the energy ecosystem, energy innovation e ecosystem here, I would say today's two speakers would be very high on my list, probably right at the top. So we have, I'll introduce them in reverse speaking order, uh, Professor Ichwei, the head of the Precord Institute, uh, Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Energy Systems Engineering, uh, our new department, uh, where a few of us are as well, uh, photon science and a few other things, uh, world-renowned uh, researcher in uh, batteries and solar cells and whatnot. And then uh, leading off today, uh, probably one of the most impactful person without uh, taking too much, without taking as much credit as he deserves, we have Brian Bartholomew, who's actually an alumni, PhD alumni of the Material Science and Engineering Department here. And he runs a, a program called the uh, Innovation Tr uh, Transfer Program on uh, uh, through the Tomcat Center for um, Sustainable Energy Systems. I got all that right. Thanks. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Brian uh, to start and then Ida uh, jump in. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction, John. And good afternoon, everybody. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, give you a sort, sort of a personal view of this energy uh, innovation ecosystem here at Stanford. And I think you're all very lucky that we have uh, Professor Yi Tsui joining us He's a, definitely a world-renowned and recognized scientist, innovator, and entrepreneur. And the two of us are going to kind of tag team. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to be too chaotic, but we'll try to uh, uh, choreograph things and uh, walk you through perhaps our personal views of this ecosystem. We won't cover it in its totality, but we'll try to give you as complete a picture as we possibly can. So the first thing I think to, to, to kind of set the stage and calibrate ourselves is to look at the, the extensive energy ecosystem we have here at Stanford. It's pretty staggering. It's, like I would say, one of the largest focus, a focus areas. Uh, you know, there's over 300 faculty involved in one or another aspect of energy, be it technology or policy or finance or the regulatory aspects. And this is in all seven schools. So there's even health aspects, uh, you know, uh, environmental justice aspects. There's all manner of issues associated with energy that are uh, the subject of focus and interest here at Stanford. And there's also, uh, you know, over 100 energy-related classes. It may be much more than that. There's classes popping up on a regular basis, and uh, uh, it there again, there's a richness uh, that the students really can benefit from and uh, do benefit from. There's also, uh, you know, over 20 energy-related centers, initiatives, uh, institutes, again, roughly focusing on a sort of a thematic area, but there's a lot of overlap. In typical Stanford fashion, we have this sort of decentralized overlapping uh, uh, system where there's a lot of, there's multiple ways of looking at the same problem. And I think this, even though it can look sometimes a little bit chaotic and inefficient, I think has a very powerful effect in terms of uh, letting multiple school, schools of thought prevail, as a wise man once said. There's also seven student-led clubs. There could be more. The Stanford Energy Club, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is perhaps one that reaches more students on campus than any other. A very active club that tends to uh, serve as an intermediary among different student groups and also between the faculty and students and outside uh, uh, the external community and Stanford. 
And very, just starting this year, we have a new energy theme house, which Holmes Hummel here uh, uh, leads. Uh, another really interesting and vibrant addition to this ecosystem. And then, of course, we have a, a remarkable resource in, in, in terms of the National Lab, SLAC National Lab, which is just up the road. And this is a, 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 an institution that uh, is very, very deeply enmeshed with the technical work that goes on here at Stanford. Maybe you would make a comment about SLAC and how faculty and students interact with SLAC? myself have a joint appointment with campus as well as Slack. Um, as you know, Slack has this amazing facility, the synchrotron X-ray, and also the free uh, X-ray electron laser. So this, and also cryogenic electron microscopy facility, this really offer very powerful tools to understand the energy technology problems. Uh, it's also a way to uh, engage with Department of Energy a lot. For example, we are in the process at Preco Institute with SLAC to join start a battery research center. This will offer additional resources in addition to our Storage X initiative here on campus to work side by side, Storage X initiative, work with industry investors a lot, and uh, the joint center with Slack will open up the opportunity with Department of Energy. So this work hand, hand in hand to enhance the whole uh, energy innovation ecosystem here at Stanford. Brian, I'll let you go on. Another Good point of calibration is to look at the impact, the economic impact Stanford has had over the years. This is a study, unfortunately, only up to 2012. Uh, if any of you know Chuck Easley, please try and convince him to update this study. But by 2012, there had been 18,000 companies formed in California alone, with revenues over a trillion dollars, employing more than 3 million people. And perhaps the most important part was about 40% of these companies were within a one hour radius, 60 miles of Stanford. And this is the secret sauce of Silicon Valley. This created this concentrated uh, uh, resource that we have of experienced innovators, people experienced at product commercialization, all the ancillary services, the financing, et cetera, et cetera, that supported wave after wave of innovation in the Valley. And this is something I think that is extremely significant and uh, something well worth thinking about. And it's something that as we move forward with energy innovation or any innovation for that matter, it's, it's sort of an unparalleled resource that people have access to and uh, exploit and, and utilize to the fullest. So the basic innovation sequence at Stanford tends to very much be sort of core concept or technology development. Sometimes, you know, the, the innovation is a, is a business concept. Sometimes it's uh, deep science. Sometimes it's software. And then these come out from typically sponsored research, from the centers, the institutes, collaborative initiatives. They feed into this rich, ecosystem of entrepreneurial resources that we have. There are the two big, the Engineering uh, Entrepreneurship Center and the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies at the GSB, and then a whole bunch of classes that are kind of climate, environment, sustainability, energy focused. Classes like uh, Climate Ventures, Hacking for Climate, Startup Garage. There's probably, there's many, many more of them. I haven't sort of created an exhaustive list, but that's just to give you a flavor for the next stage that we have in terms of advancing these innovations out of the university. Because one of the key elements is, of course, externalizing these innovations. There's probably not much use having them just sit here. And this pathway that has been developed at the university is very mature, very effective. And then there's certain other programs. The Office of Technology Licensing has just started a program as well that helps to externalize innovation. 
And from there, we go to the much more uh, startup-oriented resources like um, you know, the, the, startup, the, the sustainability accelerator, which I think is going to be a major, major vehicle for getting new ideas out into the real world. He's going to talk about that. He's been instrumental in helping set that up, and he'll talk about that a bit later. But then the, the programs we have at Tomcat, Venture Studios, Bases, and then StarTex, of course, this great resource that we have very close to Sanford on Hanover Avenue. So in the course of, of my time here, the 10 years that I've spent working in the innovation space, it's very interesting to sort of see where the ideas originated from. Obviously, many of them come from research or they come from academic classes and labs. Uh, they may come from talks and conferences and other things like that. Uh, internships and work, there's been a number of things where people did an internship and came back with a sort of a brainwave, said, oh my goodness, these people are doing things this way and I've got a better idea. Uh, there are project-based classes, you know, where you're actually trying to solve problems, clubs and societies, and then simple brainstorming. We've had a number of extremely successful ventures where a bunch of people just got together and started to talk friends among themselves in a dorm or department about an idea that they had. And down the road, we're looking at the sustainability accelerator as being another really major critical driver of new ideas and innovations that uh, can be developed and advanced and uh, deployed. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. So the Tomcat, now I'm going to give you sort of the personal view of the Tomcat Innovation Transfer Program. Like I said, we're going to touch upon a few things, not maybe go into detail about everything because we don't have the time. But I'll just talk to you a little bit about the Innovation Transfer Program. So we're not an accelerator or incubator. What we are, I like to say, is a concierge service. So when people come to us with some concept that they want to externalize, we recognize that they all have different needs, different timelines, different capabilities. And so our job is to try to tailor some kind of best fit solution for each of these teams. That's what we do. And we complement the existing ecosystem. In fact, I would say that we shamelessly leverage and exploit every resource that's available on campus. Anything we don't have to do, we don't do. Uh, but there's an enormous uh, number of things that exist that we can then call upon to help these folks and then we also have a very experienced team of volunteer mentor advisors who help start the students and or the faculty or staff or whoever's on this team, start them on the journey of converting a prototype or a concept into a product. That's not something typically start, taught at the university. It's a, it's a process, it's a discipline. Uh, it's something that everybody has to go through. It's something that almost every team I talk to underestimates in terms of the time, money, and resource required. But this is something where we feel this is the white space primarily that we fill. So our program is open to everybody in the university. We accept applications from faculty or students or staff. Uh, there's no restrictions in the area or the impact. It doesn't have to be a gazillion dollar business that makes a hundred million dollars in three years. We don't look at things through a VC lens. Our mission is externalizing Stanford innovation. And this could be licensing, it could be partnership, it could be a, a, a major demonstration at scale of some technology. But being Stanford, a lot of them tend to be startups. So we're pretty agnostic in that regard. What we're looking for is a well-defined problem or a solution to a well-defined problem. There has to be some kind of sustainability or energy component to it. There has to be a core Stanford innovation. So if somebody is going out, comes to me and says, hey, I want to go set up microgrids in some uh, impoverished part of the world, I say, God bless you, go ahead, but that's not really an innovation. We want to see something that's unique to Stanford in what, what they're working on. The team, a majority of the team has to be at Stanford at the time of the, they apply for these grants, but the day after we make the award, they can all graduate. The whole notion here is innovation transfer, and 
we're not funding research, class projects, science projects, things like that. We actually are funding, we need to see some demonstration of, uh, you know, a willingness or a, or, or a desire to, for the people to actually take this project and go uh, have it take root on the outside. We highly recommend that they take sort of a basic business class so that words like customer discovery and product market fit aren't alien to them. And each of these projects, since it's Stanford money, we can't cut a check to a company or a person. They need to have a Stanford uh, PI, somebody who's either involved or uninvolved in the project, but it's through their department that the funds are dispersed. So in a sense, this concierge role, you can see we sort of sit in the middle and we're sort of shuttling people from academic, academic programs to entrepreneurship classes or vice versa. And we have our mentors feeding in, we feed, send people to experiential learning programs, and ultimately we help them go out. We've just helped some get into the sustainability accelerator. So we're sort of in the middle of that trying to kind of direct traffic and equip people with the tools and resources and knowledge and education that they need uh, to, to take things, uh, to externalize things from the university. So just some metrics on the program so far. Last week, we supported our 100th project, 100 projects over since the fall of 2013. We've given $5.6 million in equity-free grants to these people. And the grants are very have a very specific uh, have very specific uses that we designate. They've gone on to raise over 1.6, almost $1.7 billion in follow-on funding. Now, obviously we can't take credit for all that money because these teams actually raise that money. But this model seems to work well where we give them this initial money that otherwise is so very difficult to find. You know, to build a prototype, to do customer trials, to do market validation. There's 35 revenue generating companies right now of these grants. Oh, I should point out two things. Of that money, about $156 million has been non-dilutive grants from the government and state agencies and other people like that, foundations. Uh, there's 35 revenue generating companies now and they employ you know, almost 2,000 people. They have a good recurring revenue and the enterprise value is right now about $5.9 billion. So that's a pretty good number. I should say, I will point out in a minute that that number is a little bit biased by one company, but still it's a good number. About 20 of the projects didn't work out of the 100, and that's a perfectly fine uh, outcome as far as we're concerned because we provide them funding to determine the commercialization potential of something that they're working on. So just a sampling of companies, some which you may have heard of, Aurora Solar, we funded them. They were in our first group of companies we funded. They recently, they are the leading supplier of software for uh, rooftop solar design and simulation. It's a very comprehensive package that they, they provide. And they recently raised a $250 million round at a $4 billion valuation. That was the skew on the enterprise value. Uh, we also have other very interesting companies as Renewal Energy, these guys came up with this gravity-based solution where you could store you know, intermittent renewable energy in one of the three million oil and gas, abandoned oil and gas wells in the US. And not only can you use that to store energy as an energy storage device where you, you pull a weight up when you have excess energy and then you lower it when you want that energy, but it also helps to seal the well and prevent environmental leakages and things like that. Clear flame engines that came out of, these were two PhD students out of the mechanical engineering department. They are now currently running trucks that, with slightly modified diesel engines, they work with the these big diesel engine manufacturers, and these run on ethanol and seem to work just fine. So they're well on their way. And finally, a very interesting company, Antora Energy, again, a long duration grid scale storage, where they pretty much heat up something that, that's as cheap as mud to store energy, heat it up so it's glowing hot. And then when you either need industrial heat or you need electricity, they use thermophotovoltaics to, to uh, uh, convert the, the heat into electricity. Very interesting company. They're currently, I think, 
building a pilot demonstration system in the Central Valley. So this is, of the 100, this is just four of them that are more on the energy side. So this is a graphic of all these different companies that we have supported. And just like my, in my opening comments where I talked about this ecosystem that has been used and reused here, the Silicon Valley uh, secret sauce, our teams tend to do that for subsequent ones. These teams that we have supported uh, are a source of inspiration and a tremendous resource for our new teams. So we're trying to create this kind of regenerative community that is a repository of, of experience and tribal lore and connections and all this kind of thing. And in a sense, we have our little Silicon Valley embedded in the large Silicon Valley. Now sort of peripheral to this, as part of our goal of engaging people and exposing them to innovation, we have a program which we started very small, but now we place undergraduates in these startup companies that we have spun out. Last summer, we placed 50 students. So you get to go work in a startup company. You probably have one or two days worth of orientation. You're thrown in at the deep end and then you sink or swim. Um, it's not like working at some big company where you're a tourist over the summer making photocopies and doing stuff like that. Here, you're actually doing something that really will stretch you and isn't so much a function of what you've learned or what you know, but how you synthesize everything that you have learned and kind of uh, find a way to use it. So these, these applications are currently open and it's a very popular program that we built up. But, but some students come back and say, oh my God, I'll never work in a startup. I want work-life balance. And others say, this is just amazing. This is what I want to do. So that's the kind of goal to give them this exposure. We have some other programs. One is a graduate fellowship for translational research, where we provide two years of support for year three and onwards PhD students, where they can explore, transition to the more practical aspects of the fundamental research that they're doing. And then we also have a program called the Tomcat Solutions Program, which is sort of a three-phase thing. It's very much like what the Accelerator implemented. And we, this one, instead of catering to people's ideas, we give them specific topics. How to reduce deforestation, how to reduce greenhouse gases in the developing world, how to mitigate wildfires. And anybody can come there and depending on the sophistication or the level of your ideas, you can come and ask, apply for a grant and we support people. We've already awarded four of them. Now, I've given you the Tomcat story. Now, Yi is going to talk a little bit about some broader based university programs and then end with his story, which I think is very inspirational and I think a, a, a model that, that, that can be followed and emulated. So, oh, Thank you, Brian. So this is very exciting. Indeed, the Tomcat Center's Innovation Transfer Program. My, one of my students, Richard Wang and postdoc uh, Maurer, Pasta, they benefited from the Tomcat transfer program and started Kilberg, later acquired by Northward, uh, doing, working on lithium metal batteries. This, this has been very successful. Now I want to share with you this whole energy innovation ecosystem. It's the new school, the door school of sustainability starting. This is very, very exciting. A key feature in addition to the departments in the new school, the two institute, Prequel Institute for Energy, Woods Institute for Environment, and the third institute for sustainable society. In addition to these features, very exciting feature is the sustainability accelerator. It's trying to recognize sustainability. We need to have impact driven. <clears throat> Society impact driven, whether it's technology or the policy solution, you know, going from academia to real society, we need to do that fast. So this requires us to integrate academia resources together, working closely with external global network 
and uh, the now uh, the school setting up a, a faculty council to really try to move t- this to full speed with the scale and speed together to to make an impact. Last year, the accelerator already made thirty grants to faculty team involving students and postdocs from technology to policy and uh, cover really broad areas, giving the first test, how do we really translate solution with speed and scale? So there will be more coming, there will be significant resources pumping into the sustainability accelerator. So this is, uh, I encourage you to pay attention to this, close attention to this. This will provide huge resources to go to the next level. Next slide. Um, and also at the same time, recognizing there are many entrepreneurship related to uh, entrepreneurship program related to energy and sustainability. There's a need to help streamline the whole process. You know, we have many classes on entrepreneurship, such as the Stanford Climate Ventures, and business school has a startup garage. You've seen the uh, uh, Tomcat Innovation Transfer programs. Uh, last year, one of our Stanford friends recognized this, this opportunity right here to help streamline this whole thing, making a gift to set up the ecopreneurship program. Uh, I help serving as a faculty co-director with uh, Professor Stefanos uh, 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 Zenos in uh, business school. And we are at this moment trying to enhance the resources going into different entrepreneurship programs. At the same time, we also recognize this actual gap. There are gaps right there during this process, giving you know, how great Stanford already been doing. There are actually still gaps. We try to fill in those gaps, make it easier for students. This program is really targeting students, not faculty, you know, to integrate it uh, even more into the uh, entrepreneurship uh, for the sustainability domain. Uh, next. So I'll probably share with you briefly my personal journey a little bit. Uh, Brian and I will be open up to questions very soon. I'll spend a couple of minutes to share with you my experience. When I joined Stanford faculty in 2005, I, I would say I didn't have the mindset of entrepreneurship at all, starting our company, not, not really there. The thinking was trying to work on research problems that can have the impact in the energy space, in the clean energy space. So automatically that lead to the innovation uh, I picked the Beatrice problem to work on very early days, lead to the innovation. How do you create technology that can have much higher energy density than the current technology? So I invented uh, something called silicon nanostructure anode that can offer 10 times uh, lithium ion storage capacity compared to graphite. That really now utilizes the ecosystem Brian just mentioned, you know, within 60 miles, you see this, this is amazing things happening. Uh, entrepreneurs right here, investors right here, all the legal service, accounting service, all within our reach. Uh, forming the first startup company, Empress, this is uh, certainly a very uh, uh, interesting uh, learning uh, process as well. Starting our battery company is actually very, very hard during that process. Uh, make it to work. The technology by itself of challenge. Um, and then thinking about scaling, it's very hard. Eventually making something that's really work- workable in the real environment takes a lot of time, a lot of investments right there, not, not so easy. But along the way, um, and I do learn tremendously and uh, through working with investors and uh, entrepreneurs, um, continue the innovation on other problems I see that can create an impact. For example, I would never predict myself working on air filtration. It was really due to my travel to Asia, seeing all these PM 2.5 particles, pollutions coming back to motivate us to innovate, um, 
create a nanofiber, polymer nanofiber technologies to remove very small particles, later leading to the funding of a 4CL company. Turned out to be during COVID-19, a COVID-19 time, right? All these uh, uh, viruses, and we generated the best facial mask with uh, amazing air breathability, high filtration efficiency. I only trust my air, uh, the facial mask, so I wear my own facial mask all the time. Um, also, through this, all this process, also recognizing, I'm just sharing with you my learning uh, journey. If you have multiple technology innovation in the lab, and doing it one by one is that a scalable method. About six years ago, I recognized this problem. And uh, talking to Stanford Office of Technology Licensing, saying, hey, if I do this, spin out this one by one, and the, the, all the patterns will already expire. By the time I retire, many technologies are still sitting in the lab. So why don't we come up with a new idea how to do this in parallel? Uh, I set up the Innoway technology, now renamed as Innotech, uh, as a technology accelerator company and taking multiple, about 20 patents we licensed from Stanford o OTL and uh, you know, incubate, accelerate all at the same time and spin out Innovanio and Life Labs, for example. Innovanio is a grid scale energy storage company also based on the technology I invented in, in my lab. It's an aqueous solution battery. It's very safe, very long life, uh, very low cost. As well as li Life Lab design, that's a cooling and warming textile technology. Uh, today I didn't wear my own products, but I, I have it hanging right there in my office. So welcome to uh, stop by to try out our coolest cooling clothing as a warmest warming clothing as well. So some lessons learned is actually impact driven research lead to this journey. I think many of our students and faculty probably didn't think about starting up a company, but through thinking about how do you make an impact to the real society and travel all the way back and starting from the technology innovation you know, a spin-out company, this linkage is very powerful. And also this linkage of uh, impact-driven innovation and can get you go very far once you face difficulties, you know, something that can keep you motivated, can uh, get, up, get up early in the morning, just keeps going, it's probably that impact. That's the most important thing. I think we start, I think we should leave some time for uh, Q&A. I probably should take a pause right here and see whether our uh, students, faculty, colleagues right here uh, have questions. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Plummer. And I was wondering, you mentioned the Tomcat Solutions picks topics and challenges students to solve them. What, what's coming up next? with the Tomcat Solutions program? You said rather than taking student ideas, you challenge students with themes to solve problems. Is that correct? That's right. So the, the, the program's just a, a little over a year old. And so we've launched with these three topics. But we're kind of open to suggestions as well. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we don't claim to have the best ideas in terms of what problems need to be addressed and solved. So we're sort of open to suggestions. Right now, we're sort of pro progressing in this kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, controlled format. The Tomcat Center is only four people. We're just uh, a, a, a tiny little center that runs like a startup. So we have a limited ability to, to, to spread ourselves thin. We kind of consciously avoid doing that. Uh, but I would say that towards the end of this year, we may come up with a, a, additional ideas. But if if people have ideas, we welcome them to submit them to us and say, hey, look, you know, the, here's, a, here's a problem area that we think uh, would be interesting and we would consider it. I'm currently trying to solve a problem for Airbus with a high altitude hydrogen emissions problem. They can't get the clouds to rain. And I know that that's a colloquial phrase. We're basically trying to de-cloud seed the emissions from hydrogen jet propulsion creates nitrous oxide as well as water. And the water at high altitude creates clouds. And 
they're just creating a greenhouse impact. So that's my. Oh, so, so that's very suggestion. interesting. Actually, we we had a postdoc program and we funded a student who I think works with Catherine Gorlay on these, the contrails from. Contrail mitigation. Is mitigation from problem. hydrogen engines. So we've supported Great. some, we've supported a PhD student who's, I think, working for two years on this very problem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. So for the programs, like you described, like you supported uh, for students, I'm wondering like how many of them, they are like computational based, like like students are developing the software or like really? There's, there's quite a few of them. Uh, for instance, Aurora Solar was all, all software, AI, uh, software and, and AI and data science based. We have a number of others that are software based as well. Another company we supported is called Citrine Informatics. Uh, they use uh, AI to invent materials on a computer yeah. uh, and uh, you know to, to sort of predict <laughs> new materials. And then we have a variety of others that work on in, in the climate space on, on, on uh, the impact of changing weather on you know agriculture. We have people who look at flooding, all, again, all based on software. So there's, I would say, probably half of them or uh, half of them or a third of them are, are software based, or maybe even more. Yeah. Your uh, biggest value company is the uh, software based. Software based. <laughs> well, seeing that, I, I have one for each of you, uh, uh, both on the uh, innovation transfer program and your life journey. Uh, what is something that you didn't know when you started on these journeys that you now know is really, really important? What you didn't know was going to be crucial but turned out to be really a key thing that you learned or are still learning at this point. Who wants to go first? Well, I'll take a step at that. Um, when we started the program, I remember we had a sort of a goal uh, which was Oh, we, we, we think one thing we need to shoot for is 100 projects funded and they raise $100 million. Well, we just reached 100 projects, but we blew through the $100 million. And I think that the surprise to me was how resourceful the students are, the teams are, and also how much support, despite in the early days, in 2013, clean tech was a dirty word. And yet, our the companies that we supported in that first batch have been extremely successful. And two of them, one of them had the name Solar in its name, which was like the dirtiest word at the time. And it's become a successful company. So I think what surprised me was the support they got from investors and people externally, but also the, the sort of the drive and the ingenuity and the passion of these students. Uh, there were so many of them that I thought were just going to fail and not going to work out, and they found a way. So uh, I would say that's, it's, it's, a, it's a positive message to anybody who feels intimidated by doing something like this. I'll share one lesson I think uh, very helpful to me. I just also gave a seminar at noon with, uh, uh, to uh, energy science engineering uh, students and faculty, then having a lunch with them. I asked them, what do you worry the most? They give me all type of stuff. I look, look at that. I say, well, at the end, this is what I get out of this. You guys worry about uncertainty. You need to enjoy uncertainty right there. Uncertainty means you're still young, still have an infinite possibility. Once everything is certain, it's getting a little bit late. So, so enjoy uncertainty. Being an entrepreneur is, well, you are hungry for money all the time because your company can just like burn out tomorrow. It's always on that urgency. So there's a lot of uncertainty keep coming in. You need to enjoy that. And then use your uncertainty can explore all the possibility. If you can do that well, you'll be very successful. Two departments I'm involved in actually focus on this, and, and computational methods are, I think, one of the constraints on doing a better job on uncertainty, at least on the analytics side. Any other questions in the audience? I would say we, we've actually relied on uh, both uh, E for doing a lot of energy seminars over the year, and Brian for actually not only doing some energy seminars, but giving us really good candidates for some of these 
people who have come through the eco, uh, innovation ecosystem, including two of the four you sh showed, and coming back and talking about their journeys through the four or five year process be, be, between when they are just making their pitches to when they're actually raising these big, big, big sums of money. So I encourage uh, people who are interested in those to go on the Energy Seminar website, and we have pretty good recordings of probably 20 or 25, including about half of them from Bryant at this point. So any other questions? Holmes, I was going to call on Holmes just because I'd love to put her on the spot. Thank you both for a breathtaking bird's eye view of what Stanford has been able to develop in an emergent fashion over the last decade. I'm interested in your casting a vision into the next decade. We have just launched a new school. We have this unprecedented level of faculty involvement. We have uh, all of the support that we have sought for so long for the ecopreneur area. What do you see for Stanford's innovation ecosystem in energy in the next decade? I can give you maybe one of the most important view I learned in the past two to three years. That I think it's already shaping my own research program, my lab. But I can see broadly in the whole school, in the sustainability accelerator, hopefully the whole campus, is keeping in mind the energy problem is so big. Um, anything you want to do having a big impact globally needs to think about scale first and with speed. Well, let's just, let me just give you an example. Maybe that's too abstract. Let's take CO2 capture as an example. And we're talking about 40, 50 gigaton per year CO2 right here. And to have a relevant, to have a dent, you've got to talk about gigaton level. Automatically, if you think about gigaton level, many ideas will not work anymore. And you need to start with something that has the possibility of scaling. That actually change some of my research thinking. That will also change down the road many projects at Stanford through sustainability accelerator. I think that mindset of changing scalable change to such gigantic scale, giga level, will should be shaping the whole campus. So for the future, what one, one thing that I would like to see is that problems that aren't typically fundable through today's entrepreneurship resources find a way to get funded. And I'll just show you, I had a slide here that I was going to show. These are some of the projects we've supported. The first one is co degraded coast, restoration of degraded coastal ecosystems by involving local communities and creating, you know, creating a paradise there really, a sort of a real environmentally friendly paradise. Neil Spackman, who runs that project, if you ever go to YouTube, you should watch his report on the Al Baida project he did in Saudi Arabia, where he turned the desert into a flourishing garden. It's unbelievable. But getting funding for something like this is really hard. And so you have to come up with some creative business models. And his is working with local communities to increase the value of land. Because if you improve the land, its value increases. So how do you then utilize that and leverage that to get funding uh, in, in a way that is, that is not predatory or exploitative? Uh, Bushra Batane, she has a company called Mava Modular that makes uh, you know, net zero energy modular housing for refugees. The average stay of a refugee in a refugee camp is 17 years. The housing they're provided today lasts for three. And so she came up with this really wonderful modular system where you have students in the mechanical engineering capstone project working with her and they're manufacturing these in Jordan. I mean, Jordan has maybe more than almost any other country has an enormous proportion of refugee as part of their population and giving them decent housing is, is you know, an imperative. Uh, 
But these are hard things to get funding for. You may get some, some foundation money, some grant money. You might get some money from the UN. But really, unlike these unicorns and all these shopping app companies, it's really hard to get funding for something that's so uh, you know, fundamental. Sarah, Sarah Johnson has a company that's setting up you know, an exchange for repairing electronics in Africa. Again, something that's not going to be a multi-billion dollar business, but I mean, think of the benefits of this thing where you sort of have, create a circular economy, you repair, you reuse. So I would like to see, or my hope is that people recognize in the future that there are very valuable things that today may be considered unfundable that should be funded. So that's it, I think we're out of time. So I'd like to thank uh, Ian and uh, Brian for an inspirational talk and lots of food for the future. We'll have to have you come back in a couple of years and tell us how it all is starting to work out. And I'm sure it'll be even more exciting. So thanks very much. Thank you.